Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this month we have two uh, change orders to report on. First one is on the Fitzsimmons Peoria stormwater project work package number five. Uh, this is the last change order that will be brought to the committee. And this was for the installation of a traffic signal loop at 11th Avenue that was missed when uh, the road was restored. Um, this project was, was uh, constructed using the CMGC or construction manager, general contractor project delivery method. So the owner being the city and the contractor are more like partners. So since both parties missed this particular traffic loop, uh, we felt the most amicable way to resolve this is to split the split the cost of the change order. So that's what's reflected in the report is the city's uh, cost uh, participation in replacing the traffic loop. Uh, so that's really it on that one. Any questions? Questions, anyone? No questions for me. Thank you, Steve. That's for me. All righty. The, uh, second change order is for the uh, Quincy Intertie Improvements Project. This is actually a really cool project. It uh, takes uh, five to seven separate vault structures we had out at uh, Quincy Reservoirs, located near kind of the Quincy Dog Park. And these vault structures were deep. They weren't very safe to enter. And what we did is we we constructed a big super vault. So all the piping that comes in from Rampart, uh, Pipeline, Cherry Creek Wells, Quincy and Aurora Reservoirs, they're all being brought into this big giant underground structure and it's kind of acts like a uh, switching uh, station, moves water from different uh, sources to different plants. And because of the complexity of the project, trying to coordinate uh, different shutdowns with the demands of the system and everything, the project experienced uh, several delays and this change order is basically the result of uh, project delays. First part of it is for work that we needed to do out of Quincy Avenue. Um, we try to coordinate our projects with the Public Works Street Overlay Program every year. And it was our intent to have a uh, this project's works complete before the mill and overlay project out at Quincy. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get done in time, so the overlay occurred first, and we had to go back in and, and uh, remill and overlay a, a portion of Quincy using a more expensive asphalt than what we would have used uh, if we had done the work before the overlay program. The second part of the change order really has to do with cost uh, to the contractor for uh, delays you know, labor and equipment uh, that were just sitting on site while the project kind of languished on. So that was really the uh, component of, well, the components of the change order. Project currently stands about 99% complete. We're hoping this is the only change order we'll be bringing, but, um, Keep fingers crossed. So that's really uh, that particular change order. Any questions I can answer? Steve, when do you suspect that would be completed? Uh, well, I didn't see anything on the project update as far as a completion date. I think where we're at right now is final testing uh, for the SCADA system components, which are pretty complex. And so uh, I don't recall when that was scheduled, but probably in the next few months. Gotcha. Any other questions for Steve? None for me. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Moving on. Anything else for me, Steve? Uh, I'm good, thank you. All right, have a great day, Steve. Uh, consent item 2B, water supply update, John Murphy. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Okay, thank you. I was having some issues. Um, well, it's been kind of a challenging year a little bit. Um, we are hovering around 72-ish um, percent in storage right now. Um, the, the South Platte River currently is uh, up top in our in our mountain supply system above Spinney. Um, 
the flows there have really fallen off in the last couple of days and, and we're under a senior river call. So for this time of the year, that pretty much calls out most of our water rights. We were storing pretty good with our South Platte rights uh, for a while in June, but for a lot of this year in May and, and um, once again, now we're under this senior river call, which calls out a lot of our water rights up top. Seems like we yielded um, in June uh, better in the Arkansas uh, Colorado River basins than we did in the uh, South Platte. Um, and oddly enough, as you can see in the report, um, our average uh, yields overall in June are kind of kind of even with the five year average. So um, average been warm and dry. Uh, we've been getting we did get a little bit of rain in June up top, which kept the flows above spinny. Um, pretty good for a little while and the snow melt finally started off up there. It's, it's done now, but um, anyway, we're, um, it is what it is at this point in the year, river flows are coming down and um, we'll continue to yield what we can. We're doing everything we can to get more water up into the top of the system. Uh, for example, currently we are running an exchange uh, from one of our gravel pits in the lower South Platte River, um, Walker Reservoir. Uh, just because the river call is down low in the lower South Platte, it's very senior, that pulls a lot of the water rights down to the lower river because it calls out everybody upstream. And um, that creates a condition that allows us to exchange some water from the lower river up into Strontia Springs Reservoir. So, uh, we're releasing some water that we had stored in that Walker gravel pit and getting it up top in the system at Strontia. Um, just doing whatever we can to keep water up high in the system. But um, any any questions? Uh, not from myself, uh, council members. None for me. None for me. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. You're very welcome. Have a great day. Uh, next four items we have Sam Miller covering. If Sam is around. Sam, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, is this better? You yep, thanks. I forgot to unmute. You'd think after all this time. Okay, well, thank you so much for hearing me today. I have um, a number of intergovernmental agreements with the Mile High Flood District to put before you. Hopefully, these will be simple ones, but um, we will go through them together. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, we see it. Thank you. Um, I have presented to this committee before and uh, the first slide of all of my intergovernmental agreements um, slideshows details the mechanism by which we share project funding with the Mile High Flood District, um, which can serve as a refresher uh, if needed at any time. But as an overview, we develop a plan, we, um, and that plan, Costs are shared between all of the benefiting agencies that plan produces projects. And then when we go to do the projects, we share costs as well. So this time I have four intergovernmental agreements to our capital projects and to our plans. Um, I will go through each in detail. So this slide is just a summary. The first is drainage and flood control improvements for a first creek detention pond upstream of I-70. Um, this is the 14th amendment to this IGA where both uh, Aurora Water and Mile High Flood District have been pooling funds into a savings, um, a savings pool between the two of them until we have reached enough money uh, to construct this detention pond. Um, the plan itself identified multiple small ponds. Because of how we could get land, we moved it into one larger pond. And then uh, we've started the savings fund. So here 
is the general location along First Creek, just upstream of I-70 um, above Adonia. Each year, Mile High Flood District in the city each pay a sum of 400,000 um, into that fund. The current amount is sitting at around 9.3 uh, million, and the final project cost is estimated to be around 14.3. So we'll have a few more years to go. Um, but this uh, this IGA for this year is just for our portion, our $400,000 to continue to pay into that fund. Um, and that's the summary of this IGA. Do you support this moving on to regular council section session? I had just a question or two, if that's okay. Absolutely. In that area, uh, I live fairly close to the area. How many acres are going to be uh, consumed by that pond right there? Ooh, that is a great question. Pretty big. It is. I don't remember the final number. Sarah or Servine, do you remember? I don't know if Sarah's on. Yeah, I, and I we can get back to you on what the exact number is. Um, we've got a, a preliminary design for it, and I don't know if you'll remember, or actually maybe um, this happened prior to uh, your time here, but we did a bunch of land acquisitions and we had a um, a land swap that we did. Um, and so that information is in those documents. I'll go back and dig it up and I'll put it in the chat before Sam's done here. Gotcha. And this is for like a hundred year flood event, just for possible major catastrophe type event. Yeah, and this pun's a little bit different. It's interesting. Um, so the the process that we're going through now um, which is a little different than when this pond was um, planned and designed, is we're spreading detention among major landowners and developments and so that they're they're responsible for detention of their own sites. This one was prior to kind of that strategy. And so we actually have a um, IGA with Denver where we are, are work required to construct this pond um, upon notification because the discharge impact is in Denver is primarily what's downstream of it. So as we're continuing to see the basin upstream develop, it's important that we get that put in place. So that's why we've been um, saving money for it for some time. But yeah, it's to help protect downstream properties, not only in Aurora, but also in Denver. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, for Sam on this IGA? I have none. Okay, no, nothing for me. Thank you. Please proceed, Sam. I can. Um, the next one, a second capital improvement project, um, is another amendment to a project that is currently in process for Murphy Creek at Yale and Jewel. There are a number of um, weak spots within this very sinuous stream that we and the Mile High Flood District have identified that would be benefited by channel armoring and um, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. My cat is in the screen. Um, is would be benefited by channel armoring and um, other improvements along this stretch. We have about 1.5 miles of the main stem of Murphy Creek here, um, and Mile High Flood District will be managing the construction and design for these improvements. This particular IGA is to allow Mile High Flood District to contribute more of their own funds to a project that they are managing. There is no additional financial impact to Aurora Water at this time. It's just a mechanism for Mile High to alert their project partners that they will be donating more money to this project. Um, the first portion of this IGA, this one being the amendment, but the one from last year, included an additional project where uh, this tributary was disconnected from this irrigation pond so that it can flow directly into the main stem of the channel. Um, this portion was entirely Aurora Water funded and will not require any more funds at this time. So this IGA is only relating to the bank stabilization along the main stem and only for Mile High Flood District to contribute more funds. This IGA as well, I would recommend going to regular council if this committee approves it. Council members, do you support uh, this as well or have any questions? Yes, I, I do. I have no questions and I support. Okay, 
first two are supported. Uh, please Thank proceed, you. Sam. Last two, um, I have combined into one slide. They are both major drainage way plans. One for all the tributaries into West Tollgate Creek, which runs through the majority of the center of the city, and the other for Prairie Dog Draw um, and all of its tributaries, which you can see is out to the east, um, out near Watkins and the, um, the airport over here. Um, Prairie Dog Draw is necessary as we are seeing more development in through this area, and this master plan would establish the hydraulics and hydrology to inform future projects as as these uh, areas are being changed. And the West Tollgate tributaries has not been studied uh, in about 12 years. And Aurora Water likes to have updated studies about every 10, so it's time is just coming to the forefront here. Um, so our, our objectives would be to establish a baseline hydrology and then the peak flows to which all developments um, new and redevelopments would have to design to evaluate the stream stability and then re recommend any capital projects. Um, for a little bit on the cost per each one, West Tollgate Creek uh, is divided up half to be Mile High Flood District and then the other half of the $200,000 price tag is divided between all benefiting municipalities within that watershed. As you can see this little pink Part Semswa has a little bit of jurisdiction within this, um, but the majority is within Aurora. And so, based on the area within the watershed, um, Aurora Water and Semswa have split the remaining. Um, this is the total, but not what we're paying. We are uh, asked to pay $80,000 towards this effort. And for Prairie Dog Draw, because Aurora is the only municipality here, um, we will be covering the additional half and my all high flood district will be matching at $100,000. Um, I have combined both of these since they make sense, but I'm happy to take questions on either one before asking if we're okay to move these towards study session. Questions from council members and if not, should we move these forward? Um, I support moving them forward. I do as well. I do as well. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Our next two items, IGAs, will be covered by Alexandra Davis. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Actually, I'm going to have Rich Vidmar cover these two items because he is very close to them. So, Rich, if you want to take it away. Sure. Thanks, Alex. So, um, yeah, my name is Rich Vidmar. I'm I'm not Alex Davis. Uh, but I am the uh, manager in uh, the water resources division and a lot of the uh, forest health programs fall under my group. So um, I believe the first one on the docket is the Strancha agreement. Um, this is uh, a cooperative agreement between Aurora Water and Denver Water. Uh, we own about 700 acre feet of storage space in uh, Strancha Springs Reservoir up in Waterton Canyon. So that's uh, above Chatfield as uh, the South Platte comes out of the mountains. Um, this is a really key piece of infrastructure for us. Uh, this is basically uh, a, a point where uh, all of Aurora's water from the South Platte, Arkansas and Colorado basins come into to one point, uh, And that's where we take transmission to the city. Um, so we have our, our uh, pipelines uh, and tunnels uh, from that point that, that take water down into town. Um, so it's a key location. Uh, we've had several wildfires over the last 25 years uh, up above Strancha Springs Reservoir. And uh, with that comes uh, the increased sediment loading within the South Platte River, um, which causes siltation uh, among other other problems in terms of water quality within, the, within Strancha Springs. So to help mitigate the introduction uh, of sediment into in Strancha, uh, Aurora and, and Denver have uh, proposed this IGA to work cooperatively towards assessing, planning, and uh, designing, and also implementation of uh, several projects to reduce the sediment uh, loading within the stream. So um, if we can capture it before it gets into the main stem, it's much easier to deal, to deal with. So uh, as these fires occur, uh, the soils 
uh, the vegetation's removed, uh, the transportation of sediment's much easier, uh, water runs off a lot faster. So uh, if we can get in above the watershed, we can prevent some of that. So um, the total cost of the program um, is uh, two and a half million, but Aurora's portion of that, uh, because we own about 15% of Strontia, is uh, uh, $393,250 over the life of the, uh, the program. Uh, it will expire uh, in uh, 2027, uh, and we will uh, basically pay quarterly invoices for the actual work that's completed on the ground for the, for the project. So um, it, we will also review the IGA at the end of the term to see if we need to uh, renew it, uh, but that would be a future uh, council action. So we will have a representative uh, working with Denver Water as we're going through and assessing projects and determining uh, uh, what we what we may do. So, um, so I'll stop there for for any questions. I would like to point you to the map that's in the packet um, that shows the the Strontia watershed, just so you can see the sheer size of some of the fires, uh, the Heyman fire in particular, up there. I I believe that was a hundred and close to one hundred and forty thousand acres um, in in the early two thousands. Thank you. Any questions uh, regarding Strontia from council members? No questions from me. Questions from me either. All right, Rich, uh, please proceed then to uh, item 8 as we move 7. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question before uh, uh, is, uh, the committee supportive of sending this to study session. I am I'm so I support my me as well. Hey, okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. the second item is the uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, the US Forest Service and the Colorado State Forest uh, Service. So again, uh, watershed uh, themed MOU. Um, the MOU is to identify potential projects again within Aurora's watershed. So that's the South Platte, Arkansas, and Colorado. Uh, that would be beneficial to to all parties uh, again to uh, reduce wildfire risk, um, uh, stabilization, restoration um, uh, of the forests. Uh, really, in an effort to minimize again that water quality impact, sediment. Um, uh, and some other uh, stream bed improvements. Um, we uh, uh, under the MOU, uh, we are uh, we're not obligated for any funding. This is basically the the vehicle which outlines everybody's responsibilities between the Aurora Water, the Forest Service, and the State Forest Service. Um, so there's no funding associated with this MOU. It's basically setting up the framework for for future work. So. Our only obligation is to develop a 5 year plan to look at uh, cooperatively, uh, cooperatively again with projects or for projects uh, within those basins. Um, which we're drafting a plan right now. So, uh, uh, so what will happen is as those projects come to fruition, uh, we will develop a collection agreement and identify what Aurora's responsibilities on the financial side are to support these projects. And those will be future council actions that we will bring forward. So um, this MOU will expire in, in 2026. Um, so pretty simple one, but it's, it is very much uh, just setting up the framework for, for future work. So any questions on that one? No questions. Uh, Councilor. No questions. No questions for me either. Okay. Okay. Uh, does the committee support moving this one forward? I support. I do as well. I support as well. Uh, great job. Thank you for your presentations, Richard. You betcha. Thank you. Moving on to number nine, ever increasingly important topic of conservation by Tim York. Hi, everybody. Um, I am still a little under the weather, so there's going to be kind of a group of us getting through this presentation uh, from my team, Adam Waters and Zach Vernon will be helping out. Uh, Adam has been with us uh, 10 years. Uh, Waters is his actual last name. It just happens to fit really well being in the water department. Uh, Zach's been with us four years and together they kind of make up our uh, data, special projects, analytics team. They both do a bunch of great work. So we're going to uh, kind of do this together. Let me share my screen. Uh, 
All right. So I will give a uh, little program history and team overview. Adam's going to cover our conservation programs a little bit more in depth. Um, and then Zach's going to take over the program performance review, which is really how on an annual basis we review our programs uh, to make sure that what we're doing is, is working. And if it's uh, not, make sure we can make some changes. Um, I'll do a wrap up at the end and feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So. I would like to start off with what is conservation? Um, you know, if you talk to different utilities, conservation means different things. And a lot of times what you'll hear is it's always about using less water. And although using less water is definitely part of conservation, um, we really try to focus on, on three arms of conservation. One being efficiency. Uh, so using the right amount of water, of course, part of that is making sure that we're developing uh, spaces as we grow to have a lower water demand, water footprint and then being efficient in those spaces, uh, education, uh, educating our customers, educate, uh, educating the development community, uh, making sure that everybody understands what water efficiency is. Um, and we also have kind of an enforcement. So we're involved with water management plan enforcement, uh, which is water waste, uh, water and restrictions. We are involved in uh, new development codes and ordinances, as you guys are aware, uh, planned review. So our group is, is fairly unique in that we touch uh, so many different things. And, and you'll see when we go through our programs list, all of the different things that uh, our team does. I do like to kind of tout ourselves a little bit. We are one of only two platinum recognized conservation programs in the entire country. Um, we had previously been certified and AWE changed the certification process. We went back through it again and, and again received the platinum status. So it's kind of a testament to our team um, and all the, the great work we do and uh, the way the, the citizens of Aurora have embraced conservation uh, and been part of the process. So a little bit about the history of conservation in Aurora. It is not new. Um, we had our first watering restrictions back in the late 1940s due to a short term water shortage. Um, Really, what you see is around 1980, things start to pick up the Office of Water Conservation developed in the late 1970s, first water conservation plan in the early 1980s. And then as we get into the 90s, um, you know, we start getting the permits, developing a team of water monitors, the water, the WaterWise Garden um, at the AMC campus is built as part of the AMC process. Uh, and some ordinance starting to come into play as well as rebates coming in in the, the mid 1990s as well. What you see is a whole bunch of stuff happening after 2002. Obviously, we all know what happened in the early 2000s with the drought. And we really start developing a comprehensive conservation program for the city of Aurora with uh, incentive programs, ordinances, rebates, education programs. Um, and we've continued to develop that since then. Uh, we currently are nine full time staff, uh, three year round contract employees, so that's 12. And then starting in April, we double in size. We blew up to 24 people. So uh, we do have the largest water conservation program in the state of Colorado, uh, one of the larger ones in the West, uh, which just you know goes again to show the, uh, the dedication of the city of Aurora to water conservation as we continue to grow. Uh, we are under public relations, so I report directly to Greg Baker. Um, this is just kind of an overview of our team. Uh, we kind of have a few sub small teams. Again, we all have some different things we focus on, but we all collaborate very well uh, across our individual tasks as well. Um, and this is just kind of a layout of how the, the team structure works, uh, including all of our seasonal employees and full time contingent employees as well. So here's a list of all of our programs. We currently have 24 programs or ways in which we engage with the public. So it's quite a few to keep track of. What's really important to notice on this slide is everything in blue is focused on outdoor water use. So we have four programs that are indoor water use focused. Doesn't mean that we don't care about indoor water efficiency. We just know that our biggest gains left are outdoor. Um, where we're still seeing a lot of gains on the indoor side or uh, in the CII sector and older multifamily. Um, but for the most part, our biggest focuses are on outdoor water efficiency, 
and really reducing the water for the water footprint or the plant water requirement or the need of the water use on the outdoor side of things. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Waters. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'll be reviewing some of the details of those programs that Tim explained. Uh, be moving pretty quickly in the interest of time. So if you have questions on the specifics or how they're applied, please feel free to jump in. So starting with toilets, this is one of our oldest programs that we've had offered. And since national standards have been 1.6 gallons per flush or less for about 30 years now, we now offer rebates for those to uh, even further increase the efficiency of those toilets. Like Tim said, we see much more bang for the buck with those multifamily or commercial properties that have hundreds of toilets being rebated at a time, and we get into savings of hundreds or millions, hundreds of thousands or millions of gallons. And then another similarly related program is the Low Income Water Efficiency Program, which uh, we partner with Mile High Youth Corps to go fully replace both toilets and then other water fixtures in the house, shower heads and aerators for free. Um, it's a great program to help our customers be more efficient and spe uh, specifically target those where water bills might be an income burden on them or an expenditure burden on them as well. And then we piggyback off of the LEAP qualifi qualifications for that to determine eligibility for that on income. Waterwise landscape rebates are another one of our old ones. I believe they've been going since around 2003, uh, that drought after that point. Um, this is one of the more robust in the state and country. We offer up to $3,000 to help replace existing healthy turf in front yards or visible side yards. So that has the dual function of both helping an individual customer reduce their water footprint, but also promote waterwise landscape as an alternative to tradition lawn, traditional lawn grasses. Well, we extend that out to commercial and multifamily as well. We are starting to stray beyond the traditional $50,000 limit for those properties as these projects, especially in the scope that we would want them to do, are becoming more and more expensive. So we take a look at the potential water savings of these projects and use that as a, um, develop a cost per acre foot for those and use that to guide whether we're able to open up further funding for some of these projects as well. So really big impact and important component of our conservation programs here. Irrigation rebates are designed to both bring old construction up to our current code standards that are enforced uh, during development and construction and also provide some incentives for some of the newer technology that's coming into the market lately. This is obviously a pretty hot topic issue in the West in general, so a lot of irrigation companies are responding by putting out new equipment, and we want to both drive the market in Aurora and also assist uh, customers that are trying to implement some of these new technologies in their landscape as well. And then commercial and multifamily, um, obviously a higher dollar amount because their systems are much more extensive, but uh, limit to that, which we are not necessarily opening up further at this point. The smart technology is kind of where we're seeing a lot of both popularity and impact. Um, when, by smart technology, we mostly mean smart controllers that will automatically adjust irrigation to weather conditions, which is kind of the highest level of efficiency that we would like to see. And these tools provide a lot more convenience to do so. And we did a pilot study with a large property a few years ago to explore the savings potential on that. Even just putting these things in saves about 20% of water and if they do that and then some in-ground work, we saw some savings between 50 and 60% too. So very powerful tools to get people to use the right amount of water, that efficiency element that Tim talked about. Um, and with the commercial, so this is um, something that's offered and advertised in big box stores. It's really popular with our residential customers, um, up to $200 for that. And then the commercial and multifamily, similarly with the water-wise landscape, if the potential savings uh, exceed or reach a certain threshold, we are willing to put up uh, more money toward that. And we have a case study on that further down in the presentation. Indoor assessments kind of address both the physical equipment, so that efficiency element, but also the behavior and act as a touch point to get our customers engaged with water issues and more conscious of how much water they use in general. 
These are free for all homeowners and we go to their homes, kind of evaluate how they're using water and what type of equipment they're using and propose suggestions on how they can further reduce that. And then similarly, the outdoor water assessments do that, but looking primarily at the irrigation systems. A lot of problems with these can arise right from the get go if they weren't designed properly. And a lot of the older homes in Aurora were under that model of just dump water out onto the landscape and it's gonna be fine. So we provide tips on how to adjust the existing irrigation system and then opportunities to invest in some of that newer technology to further reduce their water use or ensure that they're using it only as much as they need, if I can borrow a term from Denver. Greatscapes is uh, similar to our low income water efficiency program, but applied outdoors. So this is a great opportunity for some uh, income qualified customers to be able to replace their water guzzling grass, which uh, can be a further financial burden on them to have to continue to maintain that and pay for water on it. So we partner with a career prep and placement program that does a lot of the labor for this, which uh, allows us to stretch our budget for this in approximately six residents a year. So this not only achieves those water savings for the individual homeowners, it also kind of furthers the appeal of a waterwise or acts as a demonstration for waterwise landscape in these neighborhoods and oftentimes kind of acts as a beautification programs and some to allow them to have a nice low maintenance, low water use. Um, in fact, we use plant material that doesn't need any water after establishment. So a really low maintenance thing that's gonna still look uh, colorful, green and uh, good long-term. Landscape designs are a more hands-on option for our customers to be able to be more involved in these water-wise projects that they're trying to implement at their homes. These are also free uh, consultation or some back and forth with our landscape architects and designers. Uh, we switched over to the virtual option to accommodate COVID, but our customers found it really helpful to be able to do just kind of email and phone calls here and there back and forth with our designers, which has also opened up our capacity to do more. Um, we're seeing this year a pretty substantial increase. I think we've already surpassed the number of designs we did last year. So that's one of our good markers in the city that the WaterWise landscape option is in growing in appeal and people are reaching out and tapping into our programs to assist in that. Councilmember Sunberg, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So how is this going to work with the ordinance that's moving forward where this is going to be required? Is it are we still going to offer this for free or what what is that going to look like? Yeah. Tim, yeah, so th th this program's not going to change um or not go away. It's actually uh, the the design program um, and the rebate program uh, are both staying. In fact, they're both being expanded a little bit. Um, so these programs will be still be intact, and they'll probably be intact for a, a long, long, long time as we continue to focus not only on the new development with the ordinance, but helping existing customers make the same changes in the landscapes. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. And just one additional thing, uh, Councilmember Gardner. Of course, with since the ordinance is focused towards new development, um, the developers themselves will be designing most of those, um, and we work very closely with most of the major landscape uh, architectural firms that work with the developers anyway. So they'll understand the specs. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of um, most of these programs are oriented towards sort of that infill of existing properties to be able to catch up to what we're trying to propose for the new development. Gotcha. I, I was on mute for my sec my second question. I've never bought a Sorry. new house, um, so is the homeowner only responsible for the backyard? Because I I guess I thought the homeowner was responsible for both, but is that not the case? It's normally not the case. In, in most cases, the builder is, is installing the front yard. Um, I'd say that's 99% of new development in Aurora. There are some old agreements, um, some very small pockets where uh, the builder does neither, but 99% of new development, the builder is installing the front yard and not the backyard. And is that is that required or is that just kind of it's what's happened? Because I'm afraid with this new ordinance, well, what if a developer says, I don't want to mess with this. You figure it out, homeowner. I don't think they can. I'd have to to double check with Public Works. It's part of the zoning inspection. 
uh, but it's my understanding that it is required. I don't know where in the city documents it's required, um, but currently it's required to get CO, uh, certificate of occupancy that the front yard is uh, fully complete. Okay. Yeah. Would you uh, mind following up with me via email on that? Just because um, if, if that's the case that the, it, it, that the developer is required, then that's fine. But if the developer can push it off to the homeowner, that's going to be a big challenge for a homeowner to take on when they're moving and all the other things. So I uh, just would want to look at that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, let me get with uh, Terry and public works and then I'll try to send you the language. Um, if I can figure out where he'll know where it is. Um, All right. Says who, when they are required, in the very few cases where they they haven't been. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. Of course. Uh, thank you. Um, and Tim mentioned the introduction of the Waterwise demonstration garden that's here at the Aurora Municipal Campus. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar or have driven by it. It was initially slated to be bluegrass, but the city kind of bought into this notion of an alternative landscape to traditional lawns. Uh, so we wanted to provide that example to the citizens and now we have hundreds of different species of plants and a lot of different themes and options on how they can apply those to their specific residences. So it's uh, both a great kind of public open space option for the workers and the city in general, but also hammering home that alternative to traditional lawn landscapes. Community gardens are a great opportunity kind of as a touch point for people to engage with landscapes in general and water use and obviously has uh, pretty immense community benefits to the areas that they supply. So we partner with them to surprise, or supply some expertise and some of the infrastructure and interactions with other city departments in order to allow these to happen. So not necessarily a direct water savings, but kind of promotes our general um, philosophy on water use. and. Thank you. Uh, irrigation plans review. Uh, this falls under the kind of that enforcement element. And like I mentioned, um, in the old notions of just kind of dumping water onto the landscape are wildly inefficient. So after 2003 started increasing different elements of the design standards that we're expecting, all um, oriented toward ensuring that especially, and this is only applied to non single family irrigation as it mentions but to ensure that those are both set up properly and can operate efficiently in the long term and using the equipment that are meets our code standards and also a little bit of back and forth with the designers on these systems to ensure that they're kind of following what we would expect similarly we have soil and irrigation inspections to ensure that once that equipment is in the ground it meets our code standards um, and they're not trying to slip some stuff in that's not um, up to our code in the background. And then the soil preparation, there's some studies that it does save substantial amounts of water over time if you properly amend the soil in order for plants to be healthy and more resistant to heat and drought conditions. So excellent. Um, and this, both of these programs kind of track the development or the scope of development in the city over time. That's why you can see the last five years or so, it's been substantially busier than we had uh, been for a while. And this was traditionally an incentive for, still is, uh, an incentive for new development to orient their landscapes more to that water-wise option. So the Z zones is for large properties that are trying to um, would traditionally put in large swaths of water thirsty turf in areas such as parkways, along streetscapes, some of that non functional element that uh, is going into the future ordinance uh, proposal. Uh, this was an incentive option for those developers to avoid paying tens or even hundreds of thousands in water tap fees. Uh, the agreement is if they put in no use or after three years of establishment, uh, normal irrigation, they won't need extra irrigation long-term. And where we used to, or initially used to physically remove the meter, now we have an allocation agreement that allows us to recoup those tap fees over time if they're not meeting those targeted water or irrigation amounts that we would expect from the this different type of landscape. And I'll keep moving on this. So this uh, kind of leans into that more of that education and information heavy. 
And what we're really leaning on lately is data centric and information for our customers so that they can both monitor and uh, diagnose their own water use. So know your flow is how that gets applied to residential customers. It's sort of a supplement to their existing water bills, similar to what Excel Energy has been doing with their water bills or their energy bills for quite a while. But it just provides some context, not just this is the volume you've used, but also this is how much you should be using. So we adjust that to the number of people and then the outdoor element, kind of that spike that you see in the graph is generated by the size of the landscapes uh, specific to each customer. So this is very customizable and just kind of that personal comparison instead of to your neighbors as other utilities kind of do. Um, and then also factors in the weather conditions of that year. So it does adjust to the conditions that we're seeing in real time um, and found very helpful for people to identify where they're using too much water and then it kind of funnels us or funnels them into our other programs to allow them to address that water use uh, that they've identified. The variance program is that same concept applied to large properties. With this one, we provide a slight incentive for the large properties to be able to irrigate seven days a week instead of the three days per week in our normal restrictions. This just allows them a greater level of flexibility, and sometimes that's essential for especially some of the older properties for them to just be able to water their entire landscape. That's pretty or extensive. Uh, they receive that monthly report card, and what we've been trying to do over the past couple of years is use that as an engagement opportunity to reach out to association boards, landscapers, property managers, some, some of those prime decision makers at these properties and explore options for them to reduce the water use or change alter their landscape to be able to have a lower water footprint so we've seen some pretty good success on some properties um, and this is um, again how we kind of identify what we call whales those large properties that has a smaller group of decision makers but a much larger impact both in terms of the footprint of their properties and the volume of water that they use And then finally, some classes. Uh, as Tim mentioned, a lot of our focus is outdoors, so so are our classes. Most of these are oriented toward giving our homeowners the skills and uh, knowledge to be able to implement water-wise landscape projects at their own homes. And then we also stray into some just popular topics of the day that is a good inroad to both uh, in themselves have some conservation elements, but it's a good inroad to keep our customers engaged and filter them and or funnel them into other programs that we offer as well. And with that, I will kick it over to Zach. Hi, everyone. So I think one of the most important things we do in uh, conservation is uh, kind of every year track our program performance, uh, review places that we can improve um, and uh, really just kind of uh, constantly constantly uh, innovate on on what we're doing um i'm admittedly biased because this is uh, work that adam and i work extensively on to do this review every year uh, but uh, we did want to share the results with you for 2021 uh, for indoor programs and 2020 for outdoor so here are the programs that are included um, in our 2021 analysis it's most of that uh, efficient usage uh, the efficient usage outreach um, as well as our rebates um, and some other um, kind of uh, uh, programs that are included here, um, the indoor water assessments, for example. Uh, one thing to note is that we we can't capture everything that you know we're doing in terms of uh, generating savings throughout the city. So this is just the place where we have good data and we're confident in kind of our methodology for for capturing both. So we'll also show you the 2020 outdoor programs. Um, one thing to note: the reason this is 2020 is because we require a full year of uh, irrigation data. Uh, after program participation. So we had to have all of 2021 in order to evaluate 2020. Uh, moving forward, we're going to kind of be combining uh, some of our uh, reporting into a single year. So next year, you'll get the 2021 indoor and outdoor all together. Um, so just something to look forward to a little more streamlined in terms of what we're presenting. But similar to what was included in indoor, it's our uh, efficiency programs as well as uh, outdoor water assessments and all the rebates. So our numbers for for both 2020 and 2021 were impacted by COVID, like like everything was. So we weren't able to do a lot of the in-person programs in 2020, um, and then even lingering into 2021, some of the um, kind of customer outreach that uh, you know was uh, was impacted uh, in terms of our, our program counts. But I uh, just wanted to show you what those look like. Uh, so yeah, close to 400 outdoor, um, just over 200 indoor. 
And then in, in terms of savings or consumption change, uh, negative is good in this uh, in this slide it's showing the actual actual savings from our programs. Um, close to 14 million gallons saved from our outdoor programs and uh, almost 5 million, well, 4.5 million saved from indoor. So uh, those of you who have been, you know, seeing these presentations for a few years will know these numbers are, are down from kind of usual, but we're still happy to report savings uh, for a total of uh, 56 acre feet for those two, uh, uh, 2020 outdoor and 2021 indoor. In terms of cost, we also like to report out on this, and the, the real bottom line is our cost per acre foot saved. So this uh, the costs that are reported here are total staff hours that are dedicated to included programs, uh, as well as the cost of, uh, of rebates, so money that went directly out to our customers. So um, the kind of bottom line there is the cost per acre foot um, is still under 10000 so um, $9,400 uh, per acre foot saved. Another set of programs that we wanted to highlight and that we track savings on are what we call our waste intervention. So the water management plan is something that you're likely familiar with. So it's our uh, basically the daytime watering restrictions and res restricting to no more than three days per week. Uh, this is handled by our water management uh, plan team, our water monitors that are out in the field every day uh, in the summer and uh, just you know doing customer contacts and uh, sometimes issuing uh, violations and, and warnings as well. So. Uh, the numbers uh, here are great. So uh, just from customer contacts alone, um, 2.1 million gallons saved, uh, 200,000 gallons saved from non-compliance warnings, and 2.6 million gallons saved from water waste um, uh, warnings and or violations. Another waste intervention program we have is our high use letter program. So this one is really low cost at this point. We have some uh, stuff that we're able to set up and run every month uh, that automatically flags customers that had uh, usage that was 200% uh, uh, or more than the same month from the previous year. Uh, we filter that list down further because that's way more than 200 customers per month that fit that criteria. So we go after an even, even higher threshold for that, uh, send out letters to those customers. And in many cases, that's kind of the end of the interaction. They get a letter, they make the change on their own, and you know, the consumption goes down. We provide links to uh, leak check guidebooks in the letter, um, but uh, some customers do reach out and request, uh, for example, an indoor water assessment or just kind of talk through what's going on at their property that might be leading to the high use. But this has been a very successful program started in, I guess, December 2019. And uh, for 2020, it's 25 million gallons saved and 2021, 30 million gallons saved. And that's just from those, those 200 letters per month. One of the things that we're most excited about over here in conservation are the new uh, the new advanced metering infrastructure that's been going in throughout the city. I think now it's uh, over 40% of customers have been switched over to the new meters, and it's uh, a real game changer for us. So instead of only being able to see one read per month for each customer, we're able to see uh, reads down to 15 minute or hourly intervals. So, so um, we can see when leaks uh, start. Uh, we can see when they end. We can see when customers are watering. We can see, you know, all, all kinds of things that are uh, really useful for conservation purposes. So uh, there's also a, a customer facing portal called Ion Water, where customers themselves can set up leak alert thresholds and kind of view a very detailed uh, water use profile. Um, around 5% of AMI accounts are signed up currently. We're hoping to get the those numbers up as you know greater kind of install saturation happens and uh, more widespread outreach can occur. But uh, AMI has been a great tool. We'll talk a little more about that later. Yeah. So one of the um, kind of case studies that we wanted to uh, pull was just kind of a cost benefit of uh, if specific types of leaks were detected via AMI and were repaired, what is that kind of savings look like per month? So you can see some of the um, some of the examples that we we put together. So if there was a stuck toilet flapper in a basement bathroom, it could be leaking up to 342 gallons per hour, and that's 246,000 uh, gallons per month. You know, it really adds up if you've got these kind of ongoing problems that are happening. And with our traditional meter reads, we wouldn't know about this until at the earliest a month after it happened, where our high use uh, script would pick it up and we'd be able to see, oh, this customer was, was way higher. But now, we can find it sometimes within the same day or same week or you know much much quicker to, to help the the customer get those issues addressed so 
uh, just a kind of a back of the envelope cost benefit study we did last year, just average of like $50 per hour and staff cost. Um, we could save almost 12 million gallons per month. So that brings the cost per acre foot down to um, $126 per acre foot save. So that's assuming kind of like optimal, you know, the leak gets repaired and everything else. But um, just to give you an idea of kind of where this tool could lead conservation in terms of some of the savings that's possible. We have a, a specific case study here with a car wash that we detected a leak with AMI. Uh, they were leaking um, over 2,200 gallons per hour. So that adds up very, very quickly to the tune of uh, $332 a day for that customer. So did an, uh, we did an indoor water assessment and weren't able to find any visible leaks, but through uh, the combination of AMI and working with their maintenance technician, we were able to ID uh, specific uh, equipment that had begun to fail in that car wash. And after it was repaired, um, we haven't seen any uh, any additional usage spikes other than what you'd expect from, from a car wash, but no ongoing continuous leaks. So uh, in total, it was nine days from the initial AMI leak outreach to resolution. So um, you can you know kind of imagine how happy the customer was that they were able to save save that amount of water on their, their what would have been an astronomical water bill if we hadn't been able to detect that through AMI. So it led to additional signups because it was a chain. So uh, four more locations in Aurora signed up for Ion Water. And uh, we, yeah, we hope to kind of see this um, you know, spread like wildfire throughout the city in terms of uh, kind of industry by industry adoption and, and uh, awareness. Wanted to highlight a few kind of innovations that we've had this year. I'll, I'll go through these quick. I know we're kind of running out of time. Um, Conserve Track is a new uh, rebate management portal. So it's a kind of out of the box uh, software, web based software that um, customers are able to uh, apply for rebates, track the uh, status of the applications, request assessments, and co communicate directly with staff. So something that's really streamlined um, the efficiency of those communications. Uh, another thing that um, Adam kind of touched on earlier is the new large property allocation agreement rebates. So these are high cost rebates, but high cost savings or high savings uh, uh, projects. So uh, Talon's Reach was the first one uh, that um, Adam really led uh, to, to kind of get this agreement structure in place. So uh, the customer is eligible for a, uh, a rebate that exceeds our traditional $50,000 threshold but they must agree to a new uh, kind of um, uh, allocation agreement where if their uh, usage uh, uh, doesn't uh, go down and stay below their allocation, they forfeit, forfeit those rebate funds um, after a certain period of time. So kind of a new innovative way for us to work with these large properties, get these um, large scale rebates in place, um, but then also um, make sure that the savings are uh, demonstrable and ongoing. Uh, another place where we're kind of innovating is um, really at a national scale. Um, in addition to our two in AMI working group, co-founded this uh, national uh, conservation AMI user group. So uh, we have on, over 130 participating organizations. Um, this got started uh, back in 2019, and it's kind of grown over the last couple of years. Uh, we have uh, participants from 11 states and. It basically just provides uh, an outlet for water providers that have a conservation program and have AMI uh, to, to talk about their experience with it, um, talk about um, innovations in the field, um, and really just you know kind of compare notes and and uh, and and make sure that we're all doing as much as we can to utilize this technology to its fullest. So we've had some pretty pretty fantastic presentations so far, and um, I think maybe a. Uh, Maybe down the line, we can can share some of the specific outcomes of, of this group, things that we've adopted that we've learned from from others throughout the country. But it's been a really interesting project. Uh, the final innovation we wanted to highlight was kind of our adapt, uh, adaptations to the to the pandemic. Um, we weren't able to do in person classes, so or in person assessments. Uh, so we we kind of set up some self paced online classes. Uh, a new uh, tips with Tim, uh, a set of video shorts, uh, a lot of uh, just a lot of ways that customers could interact with us remotely and still get all the benefits of Aurora Water Conservation uh, without, you know, putting anyone at risk. So uh, the exciting part of this is that from, you know, adopting these during COVID, uh, we've continued them afterwards. So these virtual conservation efforts are um, really much more efficient for us to 
kind of reduce some of the staff time spent on some of these uh, interactions and uh, as well as just make it as easy as possible for the customer. So uh, I believe that's it for me and I'll turn it back over to Tim for the uh, kind of big picture uh, conservation impact. Awesome, thanks gentlemen. Uh, just two more slides and we're done. Uh, I kind of wanted to show you a chart of service Give me your and what's up? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep, we can hear yep. you. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Um, this chart just shows service population and distribution going back to 1976 and the trend line. So um, what you can see is that the good thing is um, water consumption is not trending the same way as population, which shows that our community has done a really good job at adopting water conservation. Um, and our team and organization has had done a really good job at promoting it. Um, what's important to note, even though um, you know, these trend lines, you can see that the distribution is less. If we start at 2020 and go to 2021, it's even a better picture, right? It's, it's we're using less water now, um, depending on the year, it's pretty close, uh, every year as we were in 2020. Now, that being said, we're continuing to get more and more efficient, but as we continue to grow and grow and grow, it doesn't mean that distribution is not going to grow. It's just not going to grow at the same level as it would have before we had conservation programs. Uh, it's growing at a lot uh, slower rate compared to population. Then our final slide. So this, this slide is our kind of cost benefit analysis. And this includes our full conservation budget. So the numbers that Zach showed earlier were specific to the programs that were analyzed. This takes everything we do, all of the money we spend in a year, um, uh, all of the extra stuff, so the high use letters, water management plan enforcement, uh, and our conservation programs, and our savings for that cohort was 159 uh, acre feet at just over $10,000 per acre foot. So still doing a good job, uh, saving a bunch of water and doing it at a, a pretty good cost. So with that, we are done, and I will open it to any questions. Great job, Zach, uh, Tim, and um, let's see. Uh... The guys have questions. Yes, exactly. Council Member Sumber, it's Council Member Lawson. I have a question. Please. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, what I wanted to ask is, um, in developments that have like our townhomes, and this is probably I know new development maybe has less grass and and things like that that are HOA um, driven. How do you manage or how do you enforce those water conservations and how do you provide information looking in and around some? I see some people who live in these HOA communities that are kind of all together. Some management, some, some HOAs or some developments have a lot greener grass than others. So I'm just trying to wonder about the messaging and how that's getting out and in terms of water conservation or is it just based on what the HOA and how they're charging maybe us as as owners <laughs> um, to pay for water. So I'm sorry if that's kind of a, it's a lot of things in one question, but just trying to figure out how you're managing that. Um, again, like I said, I see a lot of developments that are kind of enclosed. They may have four different developments that are HOA controlled. So they might consist of, you know, apartments and then everything's put together. But I see some some lawns that are a lot greener than a lot other ones. And so are they getting tapped with um, summons and things like that? Or is, how is that being managed and enforced? So let me, let me try to answer all of that. Um, the, the outreach part depends, right? It's if it's a single family home in an HOA and they get a water bill, obviously we can we can outreach directly through them to them through the water bill. Um, we use a lot of social media, so everybody has a way to get the information. Unfortunately, if it is in an HOA where you don't pay your own water bill, um, and you're not on social media, then those that information um, goes to the, the account holder, right? The one who gets the bill. Um, from an enforcement standpoint, it, it's kind of the same. It, it's whoever's responsible for paying the water bill is the one who gets contacted if there's an enforcement issue. Um, we do have an extensive list of contractors as well. Um, so one of the challenges we run into, especially on uh, HOAs where it's common space, or commercial uh, uh, commercial developments where the person getting the bill maybe isn't even in Colorado, right? It's a it's a big corporation that owns it. So 
we try to go through every avenue we can when it's an enforcement issue to get in touch with the person who's responsible or the person who can make a decision because we know if the only thing we do is send it to the address where the water bill goes, they either don't care or it maybe doesn't even get to the right person. So um, we do use a lot of different outreach methods, whether it's trying to share information about programs, uh, we will work directly with HOAs, which is a great uh, way in for us. It's, it's been really successful this year on our outdoor water assessment program for single family detached. So we really, we, we have, Different ways to attack it, and we try to get information to people <clears throat> whatever we can, uh, whatever is the best method for that type of development. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you so much. Um, that that kind of explains um, some of my things that I've been observing. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. What other questions uh, for Tim, Adam, or Zach? I don't have any questions. I have a couple. It's it's sort of related to the messaging that Councilmember Lawson brought up. How are you advertising your services to the general public? Uh, so, like all of our rebate programs and design consultations, exactly. so it, get, it gets advertised multiple ways. So the the PR team, uh, Greg's team, does a great job. It goes out in newsletter, water bills, social media, website, um, the virtual. Uh, like the tips of Tim videos that Adam talked about or I think Zach talked about, um, you know, as a social media way to engage. Um, you know, we, we really try to kind of like I was uh, explaining to the council member Lawson, we try to use all the avenues that we can uh, to engage the public. There's not, you know, one specific way that we're getting information out. Um, we try to base our messages in the platform we're using, depending on what the message is and what time of year it is. Um, so what are we trying to communicate? Um, we'll often dictate when we do it and how we do it. Okay, thank you. And then with respect to school districts, do you work with or within them? Number, number one, for example, I imagine school districts have a good amount of turf that could be converted. And then secondly, within the school districts, is there an education campaign to teach youth how to use water efficiently? Yes and yes. So school districts from a, uh, not the youth side, but the water efficiency side um, are a little difficult. Um, uh, just being, being honest there, Adam is working on a program right now, engaging both APS and Cherry Creek School District um, to help them better understand their water use. It's kind of a clone of a, a program that he built with our parks department, which has been successful. So we're kind of taking that model and trying to get in a little bit better with both APS and uh, Cherry Creek School Districts. APS has a new uh, uh, sustainability coordinator. So I think that's going to be helpful. Um, the school districts tend to be efficient with the landscape they have, but to your point, they have a lot of grass. Um, and, and so those conversations are going to take a long time, but they are uh, something that we are currently engaging in actively um, and having those conversations to continue to try to help the school districts. The second part of your question, uh, yes, we have uh, we meaning uh, rural water, um, our uh, education and outreach team, which is a different team under public relations, is a fantastic award-winning uh, program. Um, that engages with both Aurora Public Schools and Cherry Creek. Um, I don't remember how many kids they reach a year, but it's 10 or 15,000 students they do uh, in class presentations. Uh, a lot of them are virtual now. Also, the Youth Water Festival uh, just had its 26th or 27th year, I believe. So, Natalie and her team do a fantastic job um, at educating the youth in Aurora School through the school district. Um, it is part of the curriculum for fifth graders now. Uh, so the school district has also adopted it as something that's very important for their students to learn. Uh, and it's a it's a super great program. I'm sure Greg could get Natalie to come talk at one of these meetings. Uh, I'll volunteer Natalie because she can speak on it way better than I can. Uh, but it's a fantastic group of people doing fantastic work with the youth. Uh, Natalie's group is actually fairly well embedded with both APSN and Cherry Creek uh, for all grade levels uh, and works with our science coordinators. 
Right now, they are in day two of a three day teacher workshop, a train to trainer thing called Force to Faucets. So they're taking up, up into the mountains and showing them our source water and then uh, down to Aurora Reservoir to talk about um, how, how we manage our reservoir system, things like that. So we that's another thing we probably have probably the most engaged team in the entire state on our education side as well, because these are future customers and we know that. Plus, it, it elevates conversations up to the dinner time table. So we can we can engage with the, the parents indirectly through their, their children's enthusiasm. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? I just want to reiterate, as I mentioned earlier, your work is increasingly important and congratulations, Tim, Adam, Zach, and Greg on uh, your, your award winning work and your your innovation. So maybe this is a, a presentation, a good condensed version can come before the entire city council in the near future, if you're willing to do that. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Uh, and we're right on time still on our schedule. So we're moving on to Fernando with water and sewer 23 rate and fee adjustments. Hi, how are you? Good morning. And uh, I'm going to share my screen here just for a second. Uh, Sharing. Sharing right now. Screen. My sharing. You are, yes, but we're, see. we're seeing display mode. So once once you go to display settings and there we go, duplicate slideshow. Oh, okay. Perfect. So this is usually the. Oh, did it stop? Yeah, you have to reshare it now. Mm -hmm. Stop because not... okay. Wait, what happened? Uh, okay. Now I'm sharing, right? We're okay. not seeing it. I'm not seeing oh. it yet. Something happened. Oh, so share. We share again. Now you're seeing it, right? I just don't just no. Go back and do it again. Just do the swap instead. We we're oh. seeing your presenter mode, but not seeing your slides. Okay. Share. Share the screen. Now we see it. Okay. Okay. So um, this is usually once a year, the presentation of rates is uh, usually difficult because no one likes to talk about increases, but uh, that's my job and <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, nothing I can do about it. But um, uh, last time we talked, uh, there have been some changes and uh, I want to put you in some perspective of where have we been and where are we going uh, since 2010 when we compare with the average water and sewer increases, which is a, a index that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics keep for water and sewer, which has been actually above inflation for several years. Uh, our water has been under that um, and kind of way below. So when you compare the national average since 2010, it's been about 70% cumulative or about 4% um, per year, while uh, the Aurora water has only been about 29% uh, cumulative since 2010 or about 2% per year. So just keep that in mind when we, we look at the, the work that we've done and how our rates have been going since, since 2010. Now, where are we going and what are we planning and how has that changed since the last time that we talked? So right now, what we're planning in terms of rate going forward or financial planning and, and what we're foreseeing that we're going to need for water, sewer and storm uh, change. And what we're projecting for water for 2022 and going forward in the foreseeable future is that we're going to need annual increases of, of about 5%. For sewer, 
uh, we 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 had planned four percent, and now we're saying that we're probably going to need five percent instead. For stormwater, we don't see any change from what we were planning. We were planning about three and a half every other year, but we still think that that's going to be enough. The biggest change was water. Water, we thought that we were um, going to be, uh, we needed three and a half percent every other year. And uh, right now, that's not going to be enough to 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 fund all of the the, the projects and all of the costs that we we had planned. So, water the change is 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 a, a lot different than that what we had from from last year. And I'm going to show you what really changed and where are the the biggest change in in there. So, water the change was that three and a half every other year. Now we're looking at a five percent sewer. The change was one percentage point from four. Uh, to five, so um, that's that's really the, the the biggest change. Water, sewer, uh, uh, an increase from four to five, and storm uh, stayed the same. In terms of fee, remember connection fees what the developers paid uh, at time of of um, connecting into the system. Uh, we did a presentation last month. We made a relatively change in terms of the philosophy of how we're pricing things uh, we had in terms of the future although this is really preliminary we haven't done the the study yet and the master plans are in kind of in the works uh, we we thought or we still think that we're going to need about 10 percent in water because of increases in water rights and increase in in the future infrastructure for growth we think it's going to be about 10 percent we still think that that's that's going to be right, but if this is very preliminary for sewer and storm. We think it's going to be between four and three percent. Again, this is very preliminary. Now, there's one change from what we talked last month, and this is for 2023. In 2023, in water, we we were implementing just the final phasing amount that was about four percent, um, and we were going to let leave it like that. But because of the larger increase in in um, in infrastructure costs. Uh, we decided to add um, additional adjustment based on the inflationary um, cost. Then that's called the ENR, which is an inflation uh, index that is, is calculated uh, by by a leading industry um, uh, publication, and it's based on they they have it for every city, and and in this case was Denver. We applied a, an additional adjustment to the. Uh, connection fee for 2023. So that number changed, and I'll show you at the end of presentation. And that resulted in about 11%. So, but the numbers are different between the different classes because of all those changes. So that changed from what we presented last last month, and um, and I'll, I'll show you the the full impact uh, later in the presentation. But that's in terms of the fee. Again, sewer that was planned based on the on the uh, connection fee study, and that was just what we had planned in the phase in that didn't change and stormwater we just don't have any 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 plan increases for 2023 the rest of the increases are just very preliminary this is what we think we we're going to need but in order to really uh implement it we need to do the study and we need the master plans which is what the engineers studies tell us that they need in terms of the infrastructure so those are really preliminary in terms of, of fees. Now, I'm going to walk you through kind of what uh, a ray study goes through. And it's really three components. The first one is how much do we need? That's the financial plan. Uh, who's going to pay for what? That's the cost of service. And then really the rates. And that's what are the rates are really going to be. So the first component is a financial plan. And in that case, what I do is I need to take all the information, project, do projections, and, and take that information and plan what my increases are going to be. I do, uh, and that's to figure out how much that, or how I come up with that 5%. I'll walk you through how do I do that and when I and how I come up with a 5% or just or not a 3% or, or how do I do that and why do I, do that and and, and um, just walk you through a little bit of the process. So, uh, oh, well first, really, what change and why? Why do we have to do for, or why do we have to change from a three and a half percent to a five to a five percent? What really changed? And I could blame and say, look, it's just inflation. But inflation 
is playing a role in here, but what really changed is infrastructure costs. It's really projects that we can no longer keep the frame or, or moving or, or delaying is what changed between last year and this year is that we had in our CIP about $356 million in projects uh, more. And that's really what changed between last year and this year. That's what really changed that 3.5% to 5%. And when we talk about ca uh, capital costs, and I know this is something that we need to sometimes talk and, and keep in mind, is that not all capital costs are paid with connection fees. There are capital costs that are for increasing capacity, or there are capital costs that are for growth. Those are paid with connection fees. Those shouldn't be our affecting or rate. But there are capital costs that are for renewal and replacement. There are for um, just changing the water uh, treatment plants, which Wemlinger and, and Quincy, those, those treatment plants are, are relatively old. We need to make changes on those to keep the same level of, of, of um, uh, a quality that you are used to. So those, those things need to be paid with rates. So part of those, those infrastructure costs are paying with rates and those are going to be included in the in the rate increases that that we have so out of those 356 million dollars that we added in the cip from last year to this year uh in that five-year uh, period 188 I re are really um uh, uh projects that need to be paid with with uh uh with rates so that's that's really what changed and Inflation, as I said, plays uh, uh, an impact. And just in Denver in 2021, uh, the inflation in in um, infrastructure was 9.7, and this is from from a, from a, what we call the ENR. ENR is Engineer News Record. They keep track of the the inflation. It's a it's a private entity. It's the it's a, it's a magazine and they keep track. They calculated that the inflation in, in the Denver area in terms of construction cost was almost 10%. Just to give you an idea, this has averaged in the past about two to 3%. So just 2021 was almost 10% on cost. So yes, the projects are coming more expensive, but also we needed a lot of projects because we've been kind of keeping those three and a half percent over every other year, but the engineers came back and say, look, we cannot keep delaying some of these costs. If we keep the lane, we're gonna have uh we're gonna have problems. Some of it we're gonna have uh, uh things happening to the system that we cannot we cannot uh let this happen. So we need these projects and we need to have it in this in this window. So we had to put it and we have to plan for this. And um just to give you an idea, there's like $41 million in, in, in treatment projects that are just, we have to do it. Uh, I think that some of these are the so, so, solid handling projects that are needed just to keep the water at the levels that our raw water customers are used to uh, have, the, 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 the excellent levels that, that they're uh, used to, to, to have on the every day. To keep those levels, we have to invest in, the, in those things. And some of the other projects that are here are just different. Some of these, some of these projects are, yeah, grow related that will be paid with connection fees. But some of them are for um, are going to be paid with rate because we do need to invest in the system for different reasons and need to be paid with uh, a portion with rate. So that's the reason of what changed. And at the end of the day, that's really what, what happened. So again, the financial plan, just to give you an idea of uh, what I do in a financial plan. At the end of the day, I just balance my revenues and my costs. I have a fancy name for those uses and sources of fund. I have to balance my different costs, debt service, CIP, O&M. I have things that are really not costs, but I have to make sure that I meet policy targets, uh, reserve targets debt service coverage, because when I issue debt, the, the, the people that lend me the money tells me you have to meet these certain requirements. Debt service coverage is one of those. And I have to balance that with my sources of fund or my revenues. So what are my revenues? Well, the rate revenues that my, my customer pays, I can also issue debt if it's necessary. I have connection fees or other revenues. WISE is, could be one of those. And if I have some money saved, 
I can balance that at the end of the day. Now, if those things are not enough, I have to increase rates. And that's my, 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 the end of the day, what I need to plan for to increase those, those rates. And again, my goal at the end of the, the day is find the optimal combination of debt and rate increases to maintain my reserve, to fund my own name and capital, and to maintain that debt service coverage. And that's, that's the balancing act that I do when I do a financial plan. And, I, and of course, what I do is try to make sure that I plan for uh, predictable small rate increases in time that can help me fund all of those things and what I don't want is to not do increases and wait until the last moment to do large increases. Those are the kind of things that um, I guess can really lead to trouble. I can give you an example of utilities that didn't do increases, waited until the last minute, did double digits and lead to really bad trouble. I, as a rate uh, person, as a person that works for utilities for a long time, before I was a re, uh, worked for the city, I was a rate consultant for several years. Uh, this is the type of things that we try to plan and, and help utilities with that. You plan for small increases. That's why I did 5% instead of telling you, do you really need a 5% for next year? Do I really need the money? Well, could you survive without the 5% next year? Maybe, but I'd rather have the 5% and plan for that and wait and do 12% in, in two or three years, because that's really where, where people or customers really are gonna get uh, uh, upset when you have to do an, a double digit rate increase. So the real uh, um, appropriate thing to do is plan for uh, low predictable annual increases that can help you fund and plan for the, the funding of all of your projects in the, in the future. So just to um, give you an idea of what that financial plan is going to be and what are, are those uh, projects and, and costs are, um, this is the projection from now to 2035 or of your o and debt service and capital. This is the o and uh, projection and and I do have certain assumptions of of uh, inflation and I'm actually I've been assuming inflation way higher than than what I was probably one or two years ago. If you asked me a year ago, would you uh, include a six percent increase in 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 certain items? I would be like, no, that, that that's too much. Now now I'm like, yeah, six percent is probably not as much as you should. In, in a couple of months, things have changed a lot in terms of, of projections and, and inflation thinking. But this is what I'm projecting on, on O&M uh, into, into the future. Now, this is my debt service projection. Um, of course, there's have been some increases because in my planning, I'm, I'm projecting some debt uh, at some point. This is the capital uh, uh, debt. And this is my revenue uh, projection if I don't raise rates. As you can see, we can fund our o and no problem. We can fund our debt and we can fund a portion of our capital if we don't do any increases. And I could, I could tell you like o and is not an issue. Debt service is not an issue. What we really have issue is to fund all of our capital projects. That's really what, what, what we have in some ways problems. So um, at the end of the day, when I was telling you like, I could blame uh, inflation. Inflation is playing a, a, a factor here, which it is, but that's not really what, what is affecting us at the end of the day with the increases. It's really funding the capital projects that we need to keep our service going and to keep the level of service that our customers are, are uh, accustomed to. This is really the, the, the truth. So in order to fund all of this into the future, we need to do that in case. And this is telling you, and as you can see, even with the increases, Increases are not covering all of that. Some of that has been covered by fund balances that we already have or currently have, but also some of it has been covered by debt. We are planning to issue that at some point in 2024 to cover some of these uh, projects. And part of that is, is going to help us pay for the debt and pay for some of the, the extra projects. And that's what my financial planning and that 5% is gonna do in, in uh, uh, over 
the, 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 the next 20 years of rural water. So this is the financial plan, the portion of the rate study of uh, how much do we need and how I'm going to get from now to the next 20 years of, of uh, uh, our raw water. So that's that's the first step. The next one is, OK, next year I need 5%. Who's going to pay for what? So now I do a cost of service study. And I need to figure out from each class who's going to pay for what. Now, you can say, well, why don't you just 5% for each class? Well. We have different classes, and each class uses the system differently. Uh, we have different type of services. We have raw water. We have many things. So we, in some ways, you have a, a, a rate geek like me that have to go into and, and look at the system different ways and, and do a industry standard uh, cost of service study and figure it out who is using the system different ways. So I did that, and I figured out how much each class need, need to be charged. So this is the result of the race study. And each class in some ways uses the system differently. At the end of the day, when you looked at it, it's all about who is speaking into the system and the, the ways some classes use the system different ways. Fortunately, residential is speaking slightly more than maybe other classes. And they're, 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 uh, even though we, we need a 5% across the board, Residential is using a little bit more than, than that and a little bit more of different parts of the system. So their increase is closer to a seven than five. While multifamily speaking less, their usage is more, more relatively more consistent. So their increase is relatively less. Irrigation or commercial is closer to a five. Uh, fire protection, some, in some ways, they're, they're, the they're using more of the capacity of the system, although it's just um, they're really not using the water, using the capacity that's more of a peaking component. Their increase is, is 10%, almost 11. Uh, they're a really small class, so they tend to look uh, a lot higher, but they're just a very, very small class. And I'll show you when we look at the rate that the, the rate increase is, is a couple of, of cents when you look at terms of rates. So this is in terms of, of cost of service, that second component of who needs to pay what. Then we go, really, how are we going to transform this into a rate? This is the rate design component. This is how we're designing the, the rate increases for the different classes. So service charge, we're doing a 4% increase in the service charge. Uh, we have the same service charge for residential, commercial, and multifamily. That's a 4% increase. Uh, the majority of our customers, or lar large majority, are five eight times uh, three quarter. That's uh, fifty one cents. Irrigation customers have a slightly different because they don't have um, they don't have uh, fire protection, so they they have a slightly lower service charge, but that's still four percent. The volumetric portion for multifamily irrigation or commercial are going uh, slightly different percentage. Multifamily is one point five percent irrigation and commercial for so you look commercial and irrigation is re really four percent service charge and volumetric um uh, uh, multifamily is four percent the service charge and one and a half percent the volumetric irrigation and commercial four and four now uh fire protection is i ran there to 11 it's 10.7 but uh for example, the two inch uh, fire protection is 24 cents. The 12 inch is $7.30. So that's that's in dollar amount is, is still 11%, but it's, it's $7.30. Hydrometer is going 5%. five These are the the amounts in, in, in terms of their, their uh, uh, race structure. Uh, and the residential uh, volumetric rate structure. Again, their service charge is going uh, 51 cents. Now, the residential rate structure. We have a four tier rate structure that we changed a couple of years back. Our plan in the rate structure was to phase a rate structure where we implemented the increases toward the higher tiers and we kept the first tier constant. So we're keeping that plan. So the first tier is not changing. What is changing is the second, third, and fourth year. This is to promote conservation and to also promote 
portability on the lower users. So first, second tier is going 70 cents, third tier is going $1.13, Fourth year is going two dollars. I'll show you what the bill impact is going to be at different levels of usage. So if you use zero to five, your bill is going fifty-one cents, which is only a service charge. If you're going seven, eight, nine, up to ten, ten at level at ten is four dollars and one cents. On the back, you have the bill distribution that tells you how many the percentage of bills that you have at that level. For example, this level. About 50% of all the bills that Aurora Water sends during the year are 5,000 5, gallons or less. You think about if you look at your, your, your annual bill, six out of your total bills are probably five or less. So that makes sense when you look at, uh, at your bill because during the winter and that winter quarter average is about five. People use about five or less half of the year then you start using during the winter the the uh the average bill for the for a, for an or, or average bill during the year for the customers is about eight when you when you average the usage uh, by the customer so that's about 261 but of course that's that's not really like you use five then during the summer you might use during the the average summer you might use about 13 that's seven dollars and 40 cents and that's close to um, even over 80 something percent of all the bills are um, 13 or less. 20,000 gallons, which is a very high usage in terms of the total bills, that's over 90% of the bills. That will be about $14, uh, sorry, $15 and 31 cents of bill impact. Again, that's over 90% of all the bills that we sent. So that's only a small proportion of the bills that we have in our raw water. That's less than 5% of the, the bills that we sent uh, during, during the year. So next is just, let me, so it's a couple of examples of uh, bills. So again, winter usage, about 5,000 gallons. That's only gonna be about 51 cents uh, impact. Average usage, again, this is only water. Average usage, about 8,000 gallons, $2.61. Average summer usage, about 13,000 gallons, $7.41. A high usage customer, $25,000. That is 25,000 gallons, sorry, $25.31. So these are different levels of, of bill impacts that you have at different levels of, of usage. Uh, so this is only water. Next, we have sewer and storm and sewer and storm is relatively easier and more straightforward because it's across the board sewer we're we're still planning five percent one of the biggest line items in sewer is metro metro is planning about five percent in rates uh we have a huge project in 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 um, sewer which is uh first creek some of that is gross a portion of that is is um oh, uh, i think Greg put some of that, but I couldn't read. Um, First Creek Interceptor is, is a huge project that, that we have, we have uh, which is $56 million. A portion of that is going to be paid with re uh, rates. Uh, we had Sand Creek. We have uh, Senac Creek, uh, which is a project that is under construction. We have another project in Colfax. Uh, there's about $60 million. So we do have large project in the next five years, about $141 million total. Some of that is system improvement, some of that is development. Again, a lot of projects that is costing, but from where we were, which was about 4% every year, we just increased to five, so 1%. Uh, still, you, you don't wanna see additional or, or those changes, but it was part of what that, that planning. We are planning to, to issue that next year, about 40 to $45 million in, in debt for sewer fund some of these, uh, primarily the first Greek interceptor. Um, but again, part of the, the main things on sewer is Metro. Um, what the rate is going to be, is really gonna be a 5% across the board because that's usually what we do in sewer. We don't have a, a different rate structure by, by the different classes in that case. So. How is that going to affect the average residential? It's going to be about $1.61. 
123 for sewer and 38 cents for, for storm water. Storm is going to be three and a half percent, sewer is going to be five. So water, sewer, and storm, how does that all combine and looks for the average residential customer? And how does that compare in the whole scheme of things when we look at different utilities? So are we still affordable? Are we still comparable? How do we compare to other utilities? I ha I usually do the, the survey every year and we're still towards lower than the, 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 the median of other utilities. Again, I'm doing this this year. I, I'm pretty sure other utilities are, are, are looking at increase. I'm, I know Denver Water is looking at around four and a half percent. How is that going to really translate into rates? I will let you know in a couple of weeks because I know they're working on the increase. But for the average customer, it's going to be about uh, four and a half percent. This is all going to translate for what they're going to see in their in their uh, bill because at the end of the day, the rates really translate into an average bill. It's going to be about four and a half percent or about four dollars and nine cents. So the average uh, monthly bill is going to go from ninety one to about ninety five. Uh, 19 four dollars and nine cents that's all of this all of this presentation all of these rates really is going to boil down to about four dollars and nine and nine cents for the average customer um i every other utility is facing the same the same uh, reality um chemical costs are going uh 20 to 100 percent depending on, on on the type of chemicals electricity costs are going up uh we're facing the the, the same realities and and uh doesn't surprise me that every other utility is gonna see between three and six percent uh in terms of of rate increases connection fee uh water rights are going up and we're all seeing it uh, infrastructure costs are going up and uh we we are working really really hard to keep those increases low and making sure that our customer get the best water possible and and uh pass those increases and keep it as low as possible that's that's a that's a reality um so again this this survey i try to make sure that i'm really comparing apples to apples with other utilities some of these utilities do also sneak some uh property taxes so, for example, I live in ECCV and the rates don't tell the whole story because I also pay in my property taxes some ECCV property taxes. So uh, I tend to include that because that tells a better uh, the, the true story of what an ECCV customer really pays. So that's why I, I include all of that and do a really apples to apples. Aurora doesn't include any property taxes. Aurora Water doesn't include any property taxes part of the, the uh, oral water uh, bills or, or costs. So that's something I kind of want, usually includes in this, in this survey. Uh, connection fees, I promise you I was gonna include that. And this is just slightly different from, from uh, what we presented last month. We had to include that uh, ENR adjustment because we felt that we were missing um, some of those increases that were happening on the on the infrastructure part and um we thought that uh, maybe some of those uh, developers were probably looking at a, a too high of a, a reduction and and uh, this could be problematic but even then uh the the customers that will still follow the new ordinance would see about a thousand dollar or nine hundred and twenty six dollar decrease if they follow the the new ordinance so that's about a five percent decrease and uh, a comparison between um um the 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 increase if they follow the status quo and the decrease that's about three thousand dollar difference I put I put the increase in in a parenthesis and probably that wasn't that 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 makes it confused and I probably need to put either this one with a negative or something so sorry about that but um, if they follow status quo it's going to be an increase of about eleven percent if they follow the ordinance it's going to be a decrease of about a thousand dollars so they're still 
uh, a benefit of doing the new ordinance uh, and that's that's uh, that's going to be important so that's uh, that's good the last one this was this, this didn't change this was the plan all along with sewer we did the master plan in 2018 we planned the increases as a phase in for five years. This is last year of that uh, phase in. So no changes here, um, that's that's it. And again, the last one, this is kind of where we have right now in terms of, of the plan um, with the infrastructure, the 5% water and sewer for the foreseeable future storm no changes uh storm is in in good shape and the projects are um are in good shape and um the connection fees again very preliminary i'm waiting for the master plan and see where we are but we think 10 percent is going to be needed because again water rights and the infrastructure costs at least for growth is going up by a lot so that's it. Hopefully, I didn't make it. Uh, Council Member Sunberg. Oh, um, go ahead. Uh, this is Joanne. Uh, Joanne oh, go ahead. I just go wanted ahead. to add one thing. This presentation we usually bring to this committee, and then it goes forward with the budget process. And so we just wanted to make sure that was okay it's for information only. Or if you'd like, we can also take it to study session as a separate item. Well, I'm wondering if this should go as separately so it can be looked at closely. What do you think, uh, other council members? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it should go to study session for all of council. This is, I, yeah. yeah. I do as well. I think it should go to a separate to, uh, council. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember, I have questions. Yes, go ahead, Councilmember Gardner. So, my first question um, on Monday night, when we were talking about the proposed water conservation ordinance, the comment was made a couple different times: we have to pass this ordinance, or we're going to continue to have to increase water rates. And yet, here we are proposing nearly seventeen percent increase bet between combination of water and sewer. So, I'm just I'm confused because, you know, uh, that was stated Monday night that this was going to help us keep water rates low and, and taking it a step further. If this water conservation ordinance is as successful as is being. Sold to us, won't that decrease the need for some of these water infrastructure projects in the future? I, I guess I'm just, I'm not following the fact that we're doing this ordinance. We're telling residents what their front yard can look like, yet we're still increasing water, water rates 17% and we're still have all these other plans. Like, it seems like we're doing all of the above instead of like building in what savings there might be from this water conservation ordinance. Yeah, so <clears throat> these increases include those benefits. Now, keep in mind uh, the rate um increases we're talking about so it it we could go back and put the slide up it's not a 17 percent overall increase um that if you look at fees maybe if you include fees in there i guess you could get 17 percent. but fees are paid uh, at time of connection by developers now the cost is ultimately passed on to the the homeowner or the consumer at the end of the day um, but fees pay for system expansion, new infrastructure. Um, so a lot of what we're having to do there, um, again, is, is water mains, getting out into the system, expanding all of our systems to be able to provide service. And as you noted, uh, Councilman Gardner, the acquisition of additional water rights um, to meet demands. So the without the savings that we're proposing in the water conservation ordinance there would be additional cost impacts on rates and fees more fees than rates directly um and we can talk about how how that would impact rates it's more of an indirect impact um as we 
uh, use more and more water. Um, we have water quality impacts at all of our treatment facilities, and those improvements are not necessarily built into these costs right now. So that's the, the rate impact. Um, the other challenge is we're not yet able to, we haven't been able to acquire enough volumes of water uh, to meet future growth that looks like previous growth. So again, those costs aren't built in here. The costs would go up without a water conservation ordinance like we're proposing. Additionally, um, <clears throat> my concern is we may not even be, it, it may not be possible. Um, we, again, have been acquiring water rights and, and developing those systems and, and things as fast as we can. And our rate of success in acquiring and developing those supplies is not going to be able to keep up. Right. One other caution I will I will give, we've talked about being more aggressive in backward looking programs. So going in, partnering with the school districts or, or the city ourselves, removing turf, we're planning to incentivize those conversions. So even though we're going to look more water efficient and will be set up for future sustainability and success, it's not, going to maybe provide as much of a cost benefit on rates and fees as it might appear because we're having to generate revenue to incentivize those conversions. Um, so we're essentially buying water rights from existing customers to use for growth. But again, without very aggressively doing a combination of the ordinance for forward looking, and those aggressive programs for backward looking, there's a good chance we'll we'll be like a Westminster and show up and say, hey, we we don't have enough water. We've got to stop growing. We we can't hook anybody else up to our system until we slow down for a little while. And we really don't want to get to that point. Okay. Um I think that's all my questions for right now. And just one thing to point out is that the increases are never cumulative. Is in and in any case, a five percent in each utility will only add to five percent in total. Because if you add water, sewer, and storm, they only add to your total bill. And if I add water, sewer, and storm, they combine to five percent in the total bill, the most. Yeah. So the overall impact. Um, when we show 5%, 5%, and 3.5%, the overall bill impact to a customer is going to be less than 5%. Okay. Yeah, because it's that percent increase for that portion of the bill. Yeah, I got that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lawson, do you have any questions or comments? I'll let you go. I'm still kind of pondering this. So I'll let you go, Council Member Sunberg. Uh, Marshall, when would this then come before a study session? Um, we would either end of August or beginning of September. So we'll have to select a date. I don't think we have a date yet. So, um, yes. but that time frame. Yes, just to reiterate that we would pull this separately and present it separately. It's not uh, going to be tucked into an overall budget. Correct. We can bring this separately to council now. Just to clarify, um, what we've what we've usually done, even when we've broken this presentation out at study session to be separate and answer questions, we've usually left the regular item consideration embedded with the overall budget. Is that going to work, or do we want to? See how study session goes and see if they if there's a desire to break it out separate to, to vote on separately, or how do we want to do that? Uh, what do you think councilmember Gardner? Um, my opinion would let's wait and see how study session goes. Um, I'll just say it the irony of you bringing up Westminster and half of their city council was recalled over this very topic. Um, so it's obviously a political. Um, hot potato. So, I, you know, my preference would be to defer to the whole council and kind of let that group decide. But 
I think it should probably be voted on separately, but I would probably wait and see how study session goes. That's just my initial thought. Yeah, and we, we don't want to cause any recalls. I'd, I'd rather protect my job and all of your jobs, <laughs> which is why we're trying to be, again, out in front, do this as smoothly and, and minimize impacts as much as possible and not have to come say, hey, sorry, stop, stop. Uh, we've got to stop approving new connections. We don't, we don't want to get to that. You know, that's, if I, if I could, Councilmember Sundberg, ask a yes. question, kind of follow up to that. Um, what have we done in the past or what would we be willing to do before this is effective in terms of like community engagement and community outreach? And I mean, because if we move forward with this, I think we need to make a really strong case to folks that we got to do this. I get it that we have that, that costs are going up. I mean, my day job, I'm going around to cities and asking for higher rates for trash service than what they contractually agree to. So I get it. Um, but you know, my job on city council is a little bit different and it's to advocate for, you know, residents, constituents, and their costs are going up every single day for everything. And so, you know, while these increases in and of themselves, um, you know, are seem relatively small, possibly, um, when you add it to, you know, Netflix that's going up and your trash service and all the other things, um, life gets pretty unaffordable pretty quickly. So, you know, but I also understand my role on council is to ensure the financial viability of the city, the water department, all that. So I, I guess I'm just, you know, what I'm asking or maybe saying, I don't know which, if we move forward, I think we need to have, you know, a, a plan in place to, you know, make the case to voters, to residents, to citizens, whatever word you want to use of why we need to do this, not just, you know, an article, a couple paragraphs in a water bill saying July or January 1st, your rates are going up kind of thing. So that's, like I said, I don't know if that's a question or comment, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Marshall. Yeah, so what we've done historically is taken these to the ward meetings um, and offered, you know, gotten out there with essentially the same presentation and then shared the details at ward meetings. There is a little bit, uh of kind of interesting dynamic that we run into in those public discussions there are typically numerous residents who are not in favor of growing um as a city and so so what we typically will do when we present this is say hey these are the costs and this is a, a critical life safety we don't really so like Carbon dioxide, for example, our carbon dioxide costs have gone up like 100%. Could we lower our usage of carbon dioxide? The answer is yes. The problem is if we do that, we compromise our ability to provide safe water. So that, that gets into the lead question, right? So Flint did that. They said, hey, we're gonna cut back on some chemical costs. And then they caused, all kinds of violations and they exposed everybody to lead. And so what we typically do when we present these is we say, look, we've got all these regulatory requirements, all these cost drivers, there's not much discretionary budget within the water utility. Now, could we do less stormwater maintenance? You know, that's a question. Yeah, we probably could, but then we complaints go through the roof people are not happy when properties flood so everything we can look at if we if we push something on the left something on the right goes up and so we have gone to to the ward meetings we've presented all the details we've answered all the questions one of the big things we've gotten feedback in the past is well and we fix this so aurora's water rate it used to be when we do when we would do a rate increase we would do a 5% water rate increase and need, and I think Fernando showed we needed 7% additional revenue from single family. When we used to do that, we used to have to apply it uniformly across all single family rate payers because our tier was zero to 20,000 um, gallons a month of usage, which pretty much everybody fit in. Yeah. A lot of the feedback we got from those ward meetings and the public discussion in the past was, hey, this isn't 
it isn't fair, it's not equitable, there's a lot of low income people, a lot of fixed income people, how can we minimize the burden? And so, interestingly, the way our costs in the system work, our peak flows, like with uh, the fire suppression that Fernando talked about, or with irrigation, drive a lot of the costs on the top end of our budget. So if we can trim those peaks, our co costs go down. That's a benefit. That's one of the tangential benefits or indirect connections to rates and what we're doing with the water conservation ordinance. But the other thing we did is, is for tier one, you noticed zero to 5,000 gallons of usage. We're not proposing any increase to that rate. And so that was based on uh, now we are proposing a 51 cent increase on the base fee, but not the volumetric rate. So, so how many people fixed, fall into that that bucket? Do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, so everybody is in that bucket. So the first five gallon, five thousand gallons of use for everybody is not going to be affected the rate. But then your question was probably more intended, how many people are limited to staying in that bucket, yeah, that never yeah. leave that bucket? And I think it's about, Fernando, do you, do you have that percentage right in front it's, of you? It's about uh, over 50% of all the bills that we sent uh, during the year are uh, 5,000 or less. So, and that's a little bit not exactly answering your question because yeah. the winter bills are much lower than the summer bills. Yeah. So 50% of our population's water bills will see no volumetric increase. And then there's some component, and I think it's down in the 35%. I don't know, Fernando, if you can find that number, but the number of bills that stay in tier one, I think are down in the 30% range. So again, yeah. it's the smaller properties, less irrigation, less indoor use. Um, so everybody will benefit from that. And then really what this is doing is, again, the outdoor irrigation or those peak usage months, when people start using more than 5,000, they're gonna start seeing higher and higher bills. So you, well, I, 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 have, I apologize uh, real quick. So you said about 30% of the bills would not be affected uh, by the rate increase at the 5,000 gallon level? 30% of the customers, because one thing is bills, we, 50% of all the bills that we send during the year are 5,000 or less. But what, what, like what percent of the customers won't see any increases at all? That will be customers that during the whole year won't use 5,000 or less. That's, that's a different group. Like, but, but of all the bills that we send, fi are 5,000 or less or 50% of all the bills. Okay. So, but th it's, it's, a, it's a different way of saying it. Like our, like our sometimes our customers, sometimes our bills. It's just a different different thing. So we do have about like and I have to go and check, but we we, we did that last time, but it was like about thirty percent there are customers that use five thousand or less all through the year. Just about that that is a smaller subsection. Customers that use five thousand or less twelve twelve times a month. Twelve or all through the year. That's that's just a smaller subsection. That's a number Sumber. Can I ask yes. a question? I do have my question um, yes. up here. Um, so I do agree with council member Gardner on all points that he made. I guess for me, what the question I have is as we're growing and we're building and our water needs and our capital improvements are gonna probably increase, how do we know you have 5% from 2023 to 2027. I'm not an economist, but just looking at what's going on and the impact of the economy and what's happening. How do how can we reassure people that there won't be another increase within the five years? Or is that kind of uncertainty that we have to do based on how many capital projects we're doing, how we're growing? Is that all in the mix when you're considering these um, adjustments? It definitely is all in the mix. Yeah. But there is a potential that there could be an amended increase depending on what is happening with our economy, state, whatever, all over, global, et cetera, and how we're growing as a city and how what we're doing that could maybe make these particular increases increase even more. 
You are correct. Now, I will caveat it a little bit with okay. the history of Aurora Water. So we will bring a five year forecast forward like we're doing this time and say, hey, here's what we think these uh, increases are going to look like. And we try to be a little bit conservative with that because I would rather come back next year and say, hey, we don't need quite as much. So we try to be conservative and our history has been a little more, at least over the last decade, that we've come back with lower numbers more often than we've come back with higher numbers. But it is it is forecasting, right? It's estimating, it's kind of guessing what's going to be happening with with our costs. Again, we did not a year ago, we could not have, even with what we were seeing inflation wise last year, we would could have never dreamed that some of our chemical costs would have gone up like we saw this year. Again, 100% increases on some of our chemical costs. We had one vendor uh, take the force, they, they claimed force majeure in their contracts and said, we can't even deliver. Sorry, you're going to have to go somewhere else, which puts us in a really bad place because then we're scrambling and we just have to pay. We don't even care what we pay at that point. We have got to get the chemicals to manage the water quality. So we would not have envisioned that. I hope that doesn't happen again and we can come back and say, hey, we need a little bit less. But again, it is it is a forecast for years two through five. And just to follow up, I mean, Council Member Sundberg. Okay. So I think, you know, again, I, I, you know, everybody is facing cost. Everything is expensive. I think in the messaging piece, that could be because there could be some individuals or people, residents that actually think that this is going to be the 5% without kind of weighing in possibility that there could be some uncertainty in a decrease or an increase. So I just really think that that should be really important in the, um, in the engagement process with with individuals, because a lot of this is complicated. Um, a lot of people don't understand how how this is everything that's figured in into a rate increase. Sometimes, you know, we just see these fees on our bills, and we're like, really? Until really looking at, and we always say, oh, it's the cost. We know it's inflation. That's part of it, but there's other things that go into the mix as well. So I hope that that is communicated to the public as we're doing messaging, and on us, as onus on us as well as we're trying to understand this as this too, so. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll really have to hash this out in a study session and and uh, I think there'd be some fruitful discussion there. But uh, for the consideration of time, uh, I believe we probably should wrap up our meeting. Uh, we thank you, Fernando, for the, for the in-depth presentation. I really liked your graphics and your display of where we are compared to other municipalities and even the na national level. That's pretty telling there, a really good point to make. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Uh, moving on to number 11, miscellaneous matters for consideration. Anyone have a miscellaneous matter? All right. Our next meeting will be August 17th, the third Wednesday of next month. Thank you everyone for your time today and presentations. And we'll uh, see you soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.